Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today, I'm headed back to the Answers in Genesis Kando well of content, as there is just so much of it. Today, Calvin is giving us three signs that you're about to lose your faith, and I'm curious what these three signs will be. For me, the first sign was that I started trying to avoid thinking about certain aspects of the religion, because they bothered me and didn't seem to line up with the values that I had, or thought that God should have. So if you find yourself actively avoiding certain topics that make you uncomfortable, that is a definite warning sign that your faith might just be slipping. Anyway, let's see what kind of warning signs Calvin wants you to look out for. And just so you're aware, I am recording this in the middle of a blizzard, so if you hear some funny noises going on, that's just the wind, or the children that are home from school screaming that they need snacks or something, and if I suddenly change clothes, it's because the power went out and I had to record the next day, so... Hey! But first, a word from our sponsor. Blinkist. Blinkist allows you to understand the most important parts of over 5,500 non-fiction books and podcasts in as little as 15 minutes, divided into short segments called Blinks. You can listen to them or read them, and they've got all sorts of great content there. Last time I talked about Blinkist, I mentioned that I was excited to start Neil Shubin's Your Inner Fish. Neil Shubin is one of the researchers who was on the team that discovered Tiktaalik, and from that Blink, I learned a lot of fascinating details about not only our evolutionary connection to fish, but other mammals as well. Tooth whales, for instance, still have all the genes required to build a functioning olfactory system, but they are likely completely unable to smell and lost that ability due to its general lack of usefulness in their new marine environment. I also enjoyed Other Minds by Peter Godfrey Smith, where he goes over some of the philosophy of consciousness and how it may or may not exist in intelligent non-human animals, like octopuses. With their new feature, Blinkist Connect, you can connect a second account to your own so that you can share a premium account with someone else, effectively making the premium account a two-for-one deal. And when you use Blinkist Connect, it still keeps your library and recommendations separate from the other person you connect with, so they are still tailored to your specific interests but it still makes it easy to share the titles you love with each other, letting you share what you want, when you want. They're offering my fans a 7-day free trial with 25% off a Blinkist annual premium plan when you go to Blinkist.com slash Vice Rhino, or click the link in the description. That's Blinkist.com slash Vice Rhino. So head on over there now to take advantage of this offer. be hard for the average believer not to have noticed the increasing number of many of them very well-known people who used to claim Christ as their savior that have apostatized lately. From Bible bro YouTubers to best-selling authors, from supposedly saved singers to post-Christian pastors, it seems there's nothing more that the world loves than a former professing Christian that declares that they no longer believe in God. I would just like to draw your attention to the language he's using to describe these people. Between denigrating terms like Bible bro YouTubers to describe people like Rhett and Link, who never to my knowledge made religion a part of their show, it just happened that they were Christians and had a show, to referring to these people with phrases like supposedly saved and formerly professing Christian. This appears to be a well-poisoning tactic. The people who leave the faith weren't really Christians. They never truly believed. They didn't take it seriously. They were just Bible bros, or were professing to be Christians without really believing it. Now, I can tell you as a former Christian, I was all in. I really believed it. I didn't understand how anyone could be an atheist when God's presence was so obvious to me. I was the obnoxious guy at work who regularly tried to evangelize to my co-workers. Because I was legitimately concerned about their eternal souls. I was all in. And yet, I'm sure I would be similarly dismissed as only being supposedly saved. And I actually have been accused of engaging in bro-theology myself when apologist Braxton Hunter responded to one of my videos talking about free will. He seems like a nice guy. From what I hear about him, he's a nice guy. Um, but there might be a little bit of bro-theology going on here. Of course, this is just a no-true-Scotsman fallacy. Anyone who looked like they were in the in-group who ends up falling out of it clearly was never a real member of that group to begin with. And this is how apostasy is explained away. Because if God is real, and is actually providing his followers with real experiences, then apostates shouldn't even exist. How could anyone stop believing in a god that they have actually met and had a powerful experience with? It doesn't make sense. 
So the people that did seem to be honest and sincere Christians who later became atheists must have been faking being a Christian. This was a good strategy before the internet, when most people wouldn't know anyone who went from being a Christian to being an atheist, and the stories of such people were always filtered through the apologists or pastors telling the story rather than hearing it from the person themselves. But now that pretty much anyone can talk to pretty much anyone else anywhere in the world fairly easily, it's easier to hear those apostate stories from their own perspectives, and that leaves us with two options. Either every single apostate who has talked about how sincere their belief was when they were a Christian is lying through their teeth, or they really did believe it and no longer do. And of course, these are the ones that hit the headlines, fill up the news feeds, and make big splashes. But there are many more average Joe types that regularly declare the same on a daily basis all around the world. I was going to skip this part, but then I paused while those screenshots of various deconversion videos were going by, and notice that the one that was up when I paused was a sermon from Life.Church, an organization that I've covered on my channel in the past. I feel like a sermon preached at a church is probably not a deconversion story, so this sent me down a rabbit hole of watching all the deconversion stories that they go through here, so that I can, well, firstly verify that they actually are deconversion stories, but also so I can check what formerly Christian apostates say about their journey out of Christianity to see whether or not it matches up with what Calvin is going to say about it. I'll go more in depth into what I learned there in a bit, but I did find a second video that was a Christian telling the story of that time she had a crisis of faith, but thank Jesus she made it back into Christianity. So there's two videos there that are people that are still Christian. Whoever put these screenshots together clearly just did a quick search for something like why I left Christianity and then just took screenshots of every video without bothering to make sure that it was actually a leaving Christianity story first. I mean, after all, each screenshot is only going to be visible for a small fraction of a second, so it's not like anyone will notice if they fudge it a little, right? Well, I noticed. Calvin, I think you have an intern to fire. Also, just a heads up, the place I'm skipping to in his video happens to have some b-roll of a dead guy in a coffin for some reason. It's very clearly a wax figure, but I don't just want to spring surprise dead guy in a coffin on you without warning, so this is your warning. But beyond that, let's simply ask this question. What has to happen intellectually for someone who started with a profession of faith to declare atheism later on? The only thing that has to happen is that they stop believing in the existence of God or gods. There are common elements in most people's deconversion stories, as we'll get into once we start talking specifics, but everyone's story is unique. What specifically do you have to believe to conclude that there is no God? That there is no God. That's literally it. Many Christians would say that intellectual barriers aren't the main reason people turn away from the faith, claiming it's primarily a hurt or heart issue. Yep, many atheists would say that too. Sure, there are people who stop believing for intellectual reasons, but for a lot of people, it does start with emotion. Something distasteful about the church or its members. Abuse, trauma, an unwillingness for the church leaders to answer even basic questions, hypocrisy, intolerance, etc. I watched most of the deconversion stories whose thumbnails were featured in this video, and while they all gave wildly different reasons for ultimately leaving the church, there was one aspect of their stories that was almost universal. They did not want to leave the church. They wanted to stay. They wanted someone to answer their hard questions. They valued their religion and their relationship with Jesus and wanted to keep it, and fought hard to keep it, with most being prompted by such a desire into doing a deep dive into Christianity. What means to be Christian, various Christian apologetics, theology, a history of Christianity itself, etc., in an effort to hold on to their faith. But then, through these deep dives, they discovered the intellectual reasons to not believe in Christianity. So yeah, the initial push that leads people out of the religion is usually emotional in nature, but it does frequently lead to intellectual reasons to leave. But the fact is, many people have claimed that it was intellectual barriers that caused them to reject belief in God. It can be both. It was both for me. Rare is the person who rejects the religion they grew up in on purely intellectual grounds. I'm sure they exist, but they aren't very common, and in my experience, former Christians are usually pretty upfront about the fact that there was a large emotional component in their deconversion. 
And as much as we bristle at every Christian movie whose main atheist character is an atheist because their mom died of cancer, such an event is a valid starting point on the path out of Christianity. Though the Christian movies would have you believe that that's all there is to the story. It's not the beginning of the path, it's the whole path. And that's just not true. Though, again, people are diverse. There probably are a handful of them out there who are atheists for 100% purely emotional reasons. And something like a family member dying of cancer is their entire reason that they are an atheist. But in the majority of cases, the path out of Christianity is a mixed bag of both emotional and intellectual reasons that has traveled over the course of several years. Myself included, earlier on in life. Oh, of course. You can't be an apologist nowadays without an I was an atheist until I realized X story. So naturally Calvin has one of those as well. Every Christian needs a testimony, and the testimony that has them converting from atheism to Christianity is the more powerful one. So even kids who grew up Christian would play up that moment of doubt they had as a teenager that one time as their atheist phase. I'm not saying that every I was an atheist but now I'm Christian story is a lie, but I am saying that I know of at least a few that are only very loosely based on the truth. Now, you might say that this is the atheist version of the No True Scotsman argument. I'm saying that Calvin wasn't really an atheist when he tells his story. Well, I'm not, actually. I don't know Calvin's story. It could very well be true. There have been atheists who were fairly strident atheists converting to religion. It happens sometimes. But the thing is, for a Christian, there is a massive problem if someone who is a true Christian deconverts, because nobody who has met God in the way that Christianity promises should even be capable of deconverting. So the stories just can't be true if Christianity is true. But since atheism is simply the answer to one single question, do you believe in God, then if someone changes their answer from no to yes at some point in their life, that means literally nothing to other atheists and says nothing about whether or not atheism is a tenable position. So my observation that apologists all seem to share this trope of I used to be an atheist until I encountered argument X is merely my pointing out a tired trope, not an attempt to discredit every single atheist to Christian conversion story that exists. Also, it's worth mentioning the purpose behind such stories. The apologist tells the story of their conversion from atheism to Christianity in the hopes of having a powerful enough testimony to convert unbelievers to their cause and to keep around current believers, and the story is often told boldly and frequently, which is why I'm actually a bit surprised to hear that Calvin has one, because to the best of my knowledge this is the first I've heard of it. But think of your Lee Strobels and your J. Warner Wallaces, who never shut up about having been atheists at one point. Meanwhile, the deconversion stories are often found on channels that don't regularly deal with religion, but have fans who are asking them about their beliefs. And again, one of the common threads I noticed in those videos was an almost apologetic, I'm not bashing Christianity, I'm just explaining how I got to where I am, so if you love Jesus, that's good for you, sort of attitude. Where enough people had asked them about their religious beliefs that they felt they needed to explain themselves, but they don't want to be seen as criticizing Christianity because they know a bunch of their audience are Christian. The apologist conversion story is shared freely to keep and or win souls for the Lord, while the apostate's deconversion story is shared reluctantly and with much hedging. Even in my own case, I am open about my deconversion story, but most of the time it's just not relevant to the content that I'm making, so I don't mention it. When it is relevant, I'll tell the relevant part and then move on. I actually don't think I've told the whole story on my own channel. It's always been interviews on other people's channels. Maybe I'll make that video when I'm running low on ideas someday. However, it's true that many atheists who were once connected with a church often declare it was certain hurtful events that caused them to turn away from God. Many times those hurts related to a church's stance on biblical standards regarding sexual ethics or marriage or identity issues, and may also say that they just couldn't understand how a loving God could allow one of their loved ones to die tragically, and so concluded that he doesn't exist. Yep. I mean, there's almost always way more to it than that, but those certainly did come up a few times. Whether sincere or self-serving. All of these stories have a sin component to them, either the sinful hurtfulness of others, the sin of turning away, or a tragedy caused by sin. So when a loved one dies, it's always because of sin? Kids get cancer because of their sinfulness? That seems a touch far-fetched, don't you think? 
And like, even if I grant that, a child gets cancer and dies because of their sinfulness. What does that say about a god who would inflict such a punishment on a child? I can't imagine anything that my kids could possibly do that would make me want to kill them slowly and painfully as a punishment. If not thinking that kids who die of cancer deserved it makes me sinful, then I guess I'm sinful. Where we're not really atheists, we're just rejecting God because we want to sin. Which actually makes the earlier language about not having really been Christians all the weirder. Like, we didn't actually believe in God when we were pretending to be Christians, and that's how we were able to leave the church. But we left the church because we just want to sin, we really still believe in God, we're just denying him so that we can sin. That seems a wee bit contradictory, if you ask me. But then again, if you believe the Bible is true and inerrant, then you can't really have a problem believing in contradictory things, given all the contradictions that are in the Bible. So I guess that tracks. Regardless, once a person contemplates jettisoning their faith and embracing atheism, most understand that they need a logical way to back up their beliefs to embrace their new worldview intellectually. Calvin, you would do well to actually watch the videos whose thumbnails you showed in your video, because that's not the way it goes. It's quite literally the opposite of that. They wanted to remain Christian and were desperately searching for intellectual reasons to support Christianity, but they were unable to find any. Although atheists as a group aren't monolithic in their beliefs, and every one of these folks we read about or know personally has their own story, the journey from professing Christian to atheism must include specific intellectual components, unless the atheist just shuts down their thinking. Not really. There are several different intellectual paths you can take to get away from Christianity. But also, there's a whole category of former Christians who are atheists who, yeah, maybe they didn't put a lot of thought into Christianity, they just got to a point where it didn't make sense to them, they couldn't believe it anymore, and so they just discarded it and stopped thinking about it. That is a valid position to hold. Not everybody is going to be interested enough in religion to invest significant portions of their thought life into it. And in reality, if you want to be intellectually honest, if someone doesn't believe in Christianity, then there's no reason why they should prioritize an investigation into the claims of Christianity over the claims of any other religion. And there are so many religions that you can quite literally spend your entire life doing nothing but investigating the claims of various religions, and you will never be able to get to them all. So the real question here is, why should we give Christianity priority? In my case, it's simply because it's what I grew up with, so it's what I already know and understand. But even former Christians, once they stop believing, why should Christianity take priority over all the other religions? You can have a very rich intellectual life full of thought-provoking questions and discussions without ever once bringing up Christianity. The idea that an atheist leaving Christianity is just shutting down their thinking if they don't follow the exact path that you think they should follow is just, well, it strikes me as not putting a whole lot of thought into the process of deconversion. Which seems about right for what we've seen so far. All logically thinking atheists must believe the following three things. One, belief in biological evolution of some sort. Two, belief in millions of years of time having occurred. And three, belief that the Bible can't be taken as plainly written. Well, I mean, I'd argue that all logically thinking people would believe those things, given the state of the scientific and scholarly consensus on those issues. But people are actually complicated beings, and it's entirely possible to be a perfectly logical and rational individual in one area of your life, while holding on to illogical and irrational beliefs in another. So I'm actually pretty uncomfortable with that kind of generalization. Why? Well, let's start with number one. Since all atheists must have a way of explaining how they came into existence without God, some form of evolution is a requirement for that belief system. Okay, maybe, but this video is supposed to be about the signs that you're about to lose your faith. Evolution has nothing to do with that. There are plenty of Christians who believe in evolution millions of years, and that the Bible is not entirely literal, and have very strong faith. Oh, but the AIG people will bristle at my use of the word literal there, wouldn't they? They mean plainly as written, because metaphors are metaphors, poetry is poetry, and history is history. Now, how do they determine which is which? Well. 
They'll want to get you bogged down in the weeds with hermeneutics on this one, but essentially they worked out their worldview and interpret the various portions of the Bible to be in accordance with that worldview, just like they accuse the evolutionists of doing with the evidence for evolution. Because, honestly, if we're going with a plainly-as-written interpretation and not starting from the position that AIG holds, then when we see the two contradictory accounts of creation side-by-side side in Genesis, then if we want to believe that the Bible is true, we're really left with a single option. The story must be metaphorical, holding a lesson without being literally true. Because Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 cannot both be literally true. Genesis 1 has the animals being created, with the culmination of creation being the creation of Adam and Eve. Genesis 2 has God creating Adam, then creating the animals one by one and parading them past Adam to see which one would be the best... helper for him. He then finds that none of the animals are good for that, and then creates Eve out of Adam's rib to fill that role. They cannot both be simultaneously true in a literal sense. And yet, this is the portion of the Bible that AIG is most concerned about taking literally. Except for that verse where God tells Adam that if he eats the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, then in that day he shall surely die. That verse gets to be a metaphor for a spiritual death for some reason, even though it's in the middle of a story that's supposed to be completely literal. And never mind that the way they get to 6,000 years for the age of the Earth is through adding up ages found in genealogies. It was a fairly common practice for cultures in that time and place to not only have lists of important people such as monarchs who lived for unusually long periods of time, but also to tie actual living people back to mythological figures through these genealogies. If we're being hermeneutically consistent, then that's probably exactly what was going on with the genealogies of Genesis. But because AIG is committed to their Young Earth creation worldview above all else, they twist the cultural and historical context of the Bible to try and make it say that the Earth is only 6,000 years old, when it does no such thing. Anyway, all that to say that believing in science and not insisting on taking an ancient Mesopotamian creation myth as the literal history of the world is not necessarily indicative of a loss of faith. And really, this whole idea of you must first believe in evolution before you can become an atheist is actually quite telling. What AIG is inadvertently saying here is that the evidence for evolution is so strong that they can't think of anything that could explain our existence other than either evolution or their creation myth. So if you don't want to believe that a talking snake convinced a woman made out of a rib to eat a fruit that magically imbued her with the knowledge of good and evil, who then convinced the dirt man whose rib she was made out of to eat some of the fruit as well, culminating in them successfully hiding from an omnipresent and omniscient being who is somehow unaware of their transgression and then exiles them from the garden once he learns of it, you know, because he's afraid that the knowledge of good and evil will make them like gods, then your only other option is to believe in evolution. Thanks for the concession, I suppose, but more to the point, do you know how many of the deconversion videos listed an acceptance of evolution as one of their first steps in their deconversion? Zero. The inciting event that ended with their apostasy was universally not an acceptance of evolution. I don't think any of the videos even mentioned evolution once. The things that planted the first seeds of doubt in their minds were wide-ranging, from an exposure to Calvinism, to too much focus on the church as an organization instead of focusing on God, to pastors being abusive, to the idea that abuse victims should be expected to forgive their abusers with zero consequence for the abusers, to questions that couldn't be answered, to intolerance of any disagreement, to being shunned by friends or family for daring to question anything, and the list goes on and on. I actually put together a playlist of these videos, which I'll link to in a card and in the description if you want to watch them for yourself, but if you actually listen to these stories, an acceptance of evolution and the age of the Earth does not even enter the equation. This is just Answers in Genesis wanting to make everything about evolution, even when it has nothing to do with it. Like, for me personally, I first started having doubts about Christianity well before I started believing in evolution. So again, Calvin has it backwards. The acceptance of evolution came when I no longer had a reason to reject it. It wasn't the warning sign that I was about to lose my faith, it was my lost faith that allowed me the freedom to accept the scientific consensus. Why number two, belief in millions of years? Well, the story of pond scum to people evolution couldn't have happened quickly, so belief in millions of years of Earth history is also required for atheism. Well, the two do kind of go hand in hand, yeah. 
But again, Calvin has it backwards. Old ages were first discovered through a study of geology in the 1600s, about 200 years before Darwin would publish On the Origin of Species. It's not that evolution was developed to explain life without God, and then old ages were invented to allow time for evolution to happen. It was that a study of geology will reveal that the Earth is old, and things that take a long time, like evolution, can happen if that time exists. If we were inventing old ages in order to accommodate evolution, we'd probably have an Earth that is at most about a billion to a billion and a half years old, because the majority of diversification in the Earth species has happened in the last five to seven hundred million years. From an evolutionary standpoint, there is no reason for that extra three to four billion years of time. Those years are strictly there because geology dictates that they are there. Well, no, in fitting with Calvin's theme of getting things backwards, that is actually backwards. They're actually there because they, you know, happened. The study of geology just reveals that fact. And of course, number three. Atheists obviously can't take God's word as plainly written because it claims to be the revelation from God who they profess doesn't exist. Au contraire, mon ami. Taking the Bible as plainly written is one of an atheist's favorite pastimes. Well, the ones like me who like to respond to claims put out by apologists, at least. Because when we take the Bible as plainly written, it is so obviously ridiculous and wrong. Talking snakes, talking donkeys, the Son of God, who is also God himself, not knowing how seasons work and so getting mad at a fig tree for not producing figs out of season. There are so many fun, ridiculous things to laugh at if we take them as plainly written. I mean, I guess you could get all boring and point out that Jesus cursing the fig tree was a literary device used by the author of Mark, set to bracket the event of Jesus overturning the money changers' tables in the temple, and meant to represent the fall of the temple and the end of the time when animal sacrifices would be needed, with the withering of the fig tree being the literary stand-in for the destruction of the temple, and the lack of figs being a lack of sacrifices. But that's not how it's plainly written. It's plainly written as the creator of the universe not knowing how seasons work, even though he invented them. So yeah, I actually do tend to not take the Bible as plainly written, because I prefer to steel man the arguments that I address, and the plain interpretations are usually not conducive to that end. These are the fundamentals for the atheistic faith. And there's that dig on faith that is so popular among apologists. They use faith as a denigrating term when talking about atheists, because we know that faith is not a very good method of determining truth. But then they will turn around and pretend that Christian faith is a good thing. Make up your mind. Is faith a virtue or a vice? It cannot be both. It's either a good method of determining truth, or it is not. I lean toward not myself, but y'all keep flipping back and forth, and it's kind of annoying. But do you want to know something that's truly spiritually terrifying? The fact that I have successfully reproduced three times, and am now solely responsible for their well-being. The average 13-year-old child from a Christian home that attends public school believes all three of those things by grade 8. Oh, okay. Well, that's not spiritually terrifying. That's quite good, actually. Now, keep in mind here, the Answers in Genesis method of raising kids to refuse to accept several well-established scientific facts, such as the age of the Earth and the theory of evolution, ends up with kids who grow up, learn that those well-established scientific facts are, in fact, facts, and since Answers in Genesis makes such a huge deal all the time about how it's either evolution and atheism, or creation and Christianity, with no room for any compromise, then guess which gets discarded when actual evidence shows up? The one without evidence. An overly simplistic insistence on such a dichotomy is a determining factor in the creation of atheists. But a Christian who is raised in a Christian home and is taught that evolution was a part of God's plan for creation will learn about evolution in school and think about how awesome God's plan must be. Answers in Genesis, in their desperate attempt at controlling the minds of children in order to secure the next generation of potential donors, ends up actively driving people away from Christianity because kids who have heard their whole lives that evolution is intrinsically tied to atheism grow up and learn that evolution is true. So the next logical step is that atheism must be true as well. Statistics show that the average 13-year-old from a Christian home already believes the fundamentals of the atheistic faith. There is only one 
fundamental of the atheistic faith. And that is simply not believing that a god exists. Everything else, and I mean literally everything, is fair game. And they are ripe for apostasy. You know, all else being equal, I'd really prefer not to hear you talk about how ripe 13-year-old kids are, thank you very much. But they aren't the only ones. Sadly, the vast majority of Bible scholars, Christian professors, authors, and influential pastors also believe at least two of these points and are standing somewhere along that slippery slope to unbelief, whether they realize it or not. I don't think the vast majority of people whose literal job is to do nothing but study this exact thing disagree with me is a good argument in your favor. I mean, you do you, I guess. And remember, an acceptance of evolution in millions of years is at the very end of the slippery slope into unbelief. And even then, only for young Earth creationists, as is evidenced by the long list of people you just gave who managed to accept the science while still remaining Christian. Christians who don't accept Genesis as plainly written sometimes express face-palming embarrassment at unsophisticated Christians, like myself, who do. And rightly so. Y'all make Christianity look like a cult of science denialism. You know, by denying the science? It kind of has that effect. So the Christians who have harmonized science with their faith are embarrassed to be associated with you. And that is as it should be. And in their seeming bid for intellectual credibility amongst academics, they profess that in our modern scientific age, a belief in a plain reading of Genesis 1-11, to with a talking snake and a literal atom and a young earth and a global flood, etc., is just too fantastic to believe. I mean, it is. They often go even further, claiming it creates intellectual barriers and stumbling blocks in non-believers, impeding our witness and bringing shame on the gospel. Well, yeah. If in order to convince someone that your religion is the correct religion, you must first convince them that one of the most robust scientific theories in existence today is actually a lie born of motivated reasoning, then a lot of people are just going to not believe you. Even if I told you something mundane but predicated the truth of that statement on another statement that is completely bonkers, you're probably not going to believe me about the mundane thing because it relies on the bonkers thing. I got a new dog is a mundane statement. But if I tell you I got a new dog because a wizard charged me with protecting the dog from being bullied on the internet, then not only do you just start out with excellent reason to doubt the story about why I have a dog, you have a pretty good reason to doubt the existence of the dog itself. And then people like Calvin come along and insist that there are only two types of people in the world. Those who believe in wizards who charge people with fighting against cyberbullying, and those who don't believe in dogs. But what about the talking donkey in Numbers 22? What about floating axe heads? What about water turning into wine? What about the miraculous healing of a crippled hand and the dead people that came back to life and the virgin that gave birth in the Gospels? Secular science doesn't support those either. By God, you're right. It seems like the evidence is against any of that stuff being real. Does Calvin think that he just made a point in support of his side? So which other parts of the Bible should we be ashamed of? Well, how about the pro-genocide and pro-slavery parts? But then we can move on to the rape is a property crime against the woman's father or husband part. And then maybe the kill people who pick up sticks on the wrong day of the week part. Then the, you know what, I'm going to be here all day if I list all the parts of the Bible that you should be ashamed of. How about you just stop thinking of the Bible as the perfect word of God, since it is so very obviously not. The fact is, for most Bible skeptics who are naturalists, when you tell them that you sincerely believe a dead man came back to life, they already think you're crazy. Not crazy, no. Just wrong. Now, despite what people in the comments are probably going to tell you, religion is not a mental illness. Religion is a result of a combination of our brain's tendency to look for agency, to take shortcuts, and to adapt to social situations. There's a lot more to it than that, but at its core, if religion is considered a normal part of a culture, then being religious would be an expected outcome for a healthy brain. And our predisposition to see agency where there is none, and to take cognitive shortcuts when making decisions, made the development of religion in normally functioning human brains a likely outcome. 
because they've accepted an atheistic evolutionary view of life already. Well, you've got it backwards again. It's not that they've accepted an atheistic evolutionary worldview. It's that without being compelled to believe in a young Earth and creation, there's no reason to deny the scientific consensus of evolution. So compromising with evolutionary ideas only reinforces their view. Maybe if you had managed to find a single video that cited a belief in evolution as their reason for leaving the church, that point might have some validity. Unfortunately, you didn't quite manage that. Now again, I'm sure there are some atheists out there for whom the evidence of evolution was the deciding factor in their loss of faith, but they are in the minority, and you pretending otherwise is doing more harm than good. Well, harm for your side. That's good for me, I suppose. Should I stop giving these guys advice? Eh, it's not like they'll listen to me anyway, so I'll just keep going. It almost certainly won't help them. Quite the contrary, accepting science will help them not be embarrassed for being part of one of those anti-science Christian sects. Because you are right, Calvin, other Christians do do face palms when they start hearing Answers in Genesis talking points. Because you are an embarrassment to Christianity. Christians who accept science look at you the same way that you look at flat earthers, or other creationists whose arguments are too ridiculous for even you guys to think is worthy of consideration, like Karl Baugh. Now, Answers in Genesis is often attacked by individual Christians or organizations who don't hold to the biblical account of creation. Or rather, who don't hold to your interpretation of the biblical account of creation. Just because you can't manage to comprehend even the most basic of non-creationist interpretations doesn't mean it's not based on the Bible. They denigrate us as alarmists and attempt to paint us as anti-intellectual and anti-science. Well, if the shoe fits. Saying that we should make such a big deal out of the age of the earth and just concentrate on the gospel. Well, there's plenty wrong with that approach as well, but hey, at least then y'all wouldn't be fighting against the education of children, right? But think this through. All of the other stances on origins, such as theistic evolution, day-age theory, gap theory, framework hypothesis, progressive creationism, etc., involve accepting the idea of millions of years and or evolution being true. I know, right? Like, heaven forbid we accept the ideas that are indicated by the evidence. Like, seriously, buddy, just listen to yourself. You are literally saying that in order to be a Christian who is not in danger of losing their faith, you must reject huge swaths of science and ignore what people who spend their entire lives studying these things have to say about them. And yet you sit there wondering why even other Christians attack you guys as being anti-science and anti-intellectual? How do you not see it? And how does that relate to the three fundamental beliefs of atheists? Well, because the Bible doesn't support belief in millions of years and actively teaches against it. Mm, the Bible does not actively teach against it. Nowhere in the Bible does it explicitly state that God did his creating at any particular time. That is entirely based on you guys assuming that a bunch of obviously mythological genealogies are, in fact, historical rather than mythological. But I mean, I get it. You guys think that every part of the Bible is either historical or a metaphor meant to teach a lesson or a poem. And genealogy isn't a great place to go for a metaphorical lesson. Like, honestly, what can we learn from the passage, when Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. There really is no metaphorical lesson there, and it's not very poetic, so if we're stuck with it having to be either metaphor, literal history, or a poem, then it must be literal history, right? And if it's literal history, then when you add them up, it's been about 6,000 years since creation. Science be damned. Christians that accept it, step number two, can't claim to believe in God's word as plainly written, step number three. I mean, I guess not, but you guys don't believe in it as plainly written either. You just waffle on what it means to be plainly written. So when it lists the genealogies, those are plainly historical, obviously. And the creation story is also plainly historical, obviously. Except if we are taking it as plainly written, it's two different and contradictory creation stories put side by side. So y'all have to dance around pretending that the story in chapter 2 is a filling in of the day 6 details from chapter 1, while ignoring that in chapter 2, God makes the animals after he makes man. 
Sure, some translations try to harmonize this by translating it as God had formed the animals, putting it in the past tense to make it look like he created the animals before he created man, as is the case in chapter 1, but given that the more robust translations, such as the NRSV or the Anchor Bible, translate that verse in the present tense, and that available translation notes from other versions such as the NET have scholars pointing out that this verse is pretty unambiguous in its use of the present tense, the God had formed translation seems to be less than tenable. But then this raises the question, which version of the Bible is the one that is supposed to be read as it is plainly written? AIG tends to favor the ESV, which I also tend to favor, and that version has Genesis 2.19 in the past tense, harmonizing this issue. So if we're reading the ESV as plainly written, that specific verse doesn't leave us with an issue. But what if I'm reading the NRSV? Do I accept that version of this verse as plainly written, where God is now creating the animals again? What happens when two different translations clash like this? Which one is true as plainly written, and which is false? And how do we make this determination? I'm sure at this point they will appeal to studying the Hebrew to see which version is more appropriate, but in this instance, the more appropriate translation gives us a plain reading that Answers in Genesis disagrees with, and already in this video we have seen Calvin scoff at biblical scholars claiming that they hold the atheistic view of evolution, which taints their work. But if we can't trust the scholars who are experts at translating ancient Hebrew, who can we trust? And why should we trust them over the experts? This is where AIG gets more than a bit circular. You trust the translators who translate it in accordance with young earth creationist views, so that a plain reading of the text will show us the truth of the young earth creationist views. Guys, when you find yourself fighting against experts in every field ranging from the scientific fields like astronomy, biology, and geology, to the more philosophical fields like theology, to the scholarly fields like history and ancient linguistics, how can you claim to not be anti-intellectual or anti-science? You are against all the scientific experts, anti-science. And you're against the experts in the scholarship related to the Bible and its translation, the intellectuals, you might say. So, anti-intellectual. How do you not see it? Yet, accept that secular interpretations of science should dictate their exegesis of Scripture. If reality conflicts with the Bible, that's not a problem with reality, that's a problem with the Bible. If the Bible was actually right about stuff like this, you'd expect at least the occasional secular scientist or scholar to come to the same conclusion as you, just based on the evidence. They might not conclude that God did it, but you'd expect a secular geologist to pop up every now and again who points out that the millions of years interpretation of geology is severely flawed. Or a secular biologist every now and again who points out the impossibility for evolution to move past a certain point. But that never happens, because you don't actually have any evidence on your side. Well, I mean, it kinda happens if you don't mind quote mining, which creationists usually don't, so they can make it look like it happens every now and again, but inevitably when you read those various quotes in context, they're not actually saying what the creationists claim they are saying. And as soon as a Christian accepts the first two requirements for atheism, they're now intellectually open to accepting step number one, biological evolution. Okay, I feel like that little animation should have ended on Ken Ham. Missed opportunity there. But anyway, I'm curious how you numbered your steps here. You started at step two, an acceptance of millions of years, which leads the Christians to step three, not accepting the Bible as plainly written, which then leads us all the way to step Number one, an acceptance of evolution? That's not how steps work. After all, if they accept the naturalistic interpretations of scientific data in one area, geology, there's no logical reason not to accept such interpretations in other areas, such as biology. Indeed. And since naturalistic interpretations seem to be the only ones that actually help us make any sort of scientific advancement, there's really no reason at this time to suggest that a supernatural interpretation would be helpful. In fact, lingering supernatural interpretations have often been found to be holding scientific progress back. Do I need to bring up the Church's objection to heliocentrism? Newton's appeal to God to explain Mercury's orbit, which is actually explained by the theory of relativity? The Catholic Church's execution of Giordano Bruno for daring to hold to the belief that stars were far away and probably had planets orbiting them? Naturalism wins every time. 
Now, of course, accepting these three conclusions doesn't automatically result in apostasy. No, it doesn't. And I'd go so far as to say that it doesn't even result in a sign of future potential apostasy, given how infrequently any of these things came up in anyone's deconversion story. Look instead for people who are asking questions, being given non-answers, and are being discouraged from asking future questions. That seems to lead to apostasy far more frequently than an acceptance of science. We know that due to blessed inconsistency, there are likely many professing Christians who believe in the story of evolution. Blessed inconsistency is basically Answers in Genesis business model. It's also the name of my Newsboys cover band. God's not dead. God's, God's not dead. He's surely alive. alive, alive. He's not dead. Surely alive. And therefore satisfy all the intellectual requirements for atheism, yet are truly saved. This is interesting. He's saying that it is possible to be truly saved while accepting science. And yet, he has made it his life's mission to fight against the acceptance of science, thereby placing those aforementioned intellectual barriers to belief in Christianity that are effectively preventing people from conversion. Blessed inconsistency indeed. But of course, we've all observed an increasingly rapid pace in which many professing Christians who have taken these three steps eventually become consistent in their thinking. Just read some of the testimonies of these many famous former Christians we've discussed. I mean, I watched the testimonies of the ones that you showed in your video. I paid more attention to them than you guys did. To reiterate, evolution didn't even come up once in any of them. And you'll see that in addition to any other excuse they might use to justify their conversion to atheism, they've come to realize that if millions of years of evolution were true, they already have a way to explain all of existence without God. So why bother? I mean, that is true. God is not necessary to explain all of existence. But again, Calvin has it backwards. That's the conclusion of the journey, not the beginning. So we can conclude. Although Christians who adhere to the fundamental beliefs of the atheistic faith might not always result in spiritual deadness, those who are spiritually dead that identify as atheists always have those three symptoms before they expire spiritually. Like, just before, not at the beginning of the journey. That's where the unsatisfying answers to valid questions come in. Why did God command genocide? Why is the punishment for rape sometimes to pay a fine to the victim's father and then to marry the victim? Why is slavery permitted? Why does the book of Proverbs tell you to beat your children when research shows that children do better when they aren't physically abused? How is the Bible inerrant when there are clear errors throughout all of it? Once someone starts asking those questions, they are likely to find the answers to be unsatisfactory and will probably notice some inconsistency. Morals are absolute, and you can't be moral without God. Except, when God commands genocide, that's when morals become relative for a bit. It was justified because of how evil the people that were being genocided were. Blessed inconsistency. From an intellectual standpoint, belief in biblical authority found in an understanding of presuppositional apologetics and biblical creation, are some of the best immunizers to counteract the three fundamental beliefs of the atheistic worldview. Presuppositional apologetics are the most obviously bullshit apologetics that there are. It's just one big circle of, you already believe in God because Romans 1.20 says so, therefore you know that God is real and that the Bible is his word, therefore everything you say to the contrary is you lying to yourself. Maybe it's a good insulator for people who already believe, but it most definitely will not convince a non-believer. If I don't believe in God, and you tell me that, no, I actually do believe in God, I'm just pretending like I don't because I want to sin, then I don't need to rebut your point. I already know that I don't believe in God, so I know that what you have told me is wrong, and that clearly indicates that your God doesn't exist. Because if he did, I already believe in him. Since I don't, he must not. Pretending like you know what's in my head better than I do is not going to convert me. Although the Lord's ways are far higher than ours, and we may not have a full understanding of how all things work salvifically, 
Scripture is clear that we have a biblical mandate to have a reasoned defense of our faith in 1 Peter 3.15. And presuppositional apologetics are not a reasoned defense of your faith. It appears more to be living in a constant state of desperate denial, where you have to believe that everyone who says they don't believe in your God has to be lying about it. And that we should use that to destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Except the problem here is that presuppositional apologetics is essentially the nuh-uh of philosophical argumentation. Sure, it gets dressed up to hide that fact, but at its core, that is exactly what it is. I say, I don't believe in God, you say, nuh-uh, you do too believe in him, and that's the end of it. An intellectual defense of the faith, apologetics, is actually more for the church than for the world, as it keeps believers from error. Shh, Calvin, you're not supposed to say the quiet part out loud. That's my job. But yeah, this does confirm that apologists engage in apologetics more to hold on to current believers than to convert new ones. And far from being a hindrance to the gospel, it's actually one of the ways the Lord uses to win people to himself, as many have testified. Didn't you just say that that's not what it does? Ah, blessed inconsistency. And that's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Kyrellel. I think, who says, so the subtext here is that only the right wing complains about things? This was on my video from last week on the war on Christmas. I'm not entirely sure how you got that out of it. I certainly did call attention to the fact that it's only the right wing pundits who complain about people saying happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas, but that's literally all the video was about. Well, no, it was actually more about how the right is using their completely manufactured war on Christmas to try and pass legislation that chips away at the wall of separation of church and state. But nah, man, I'm on the left and you could argue that my entire channel is me complaining about shit. I complain about creationists trying to indoctrinate their children. I complain about bigotry. I complain about the majority religion having a persecution complex where they can somehow be overrepresented in government and have control of the highest court in the land, and yet somehow still convince their followers that they are a minority and everyone is out to get them and even make their religion illegal? So yeah, everyone complains. But some people complain about things that are actually important and should be brought to light, while others complain about meaningless things, like being wished happy holidays at a time of year when there are multiple holidays, even if we only count the holidays that Christians have no problem celebrating, like Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. Thanks for watching! Don't forget to use the link in the description to get a 7 day free trial and 25% off a Blinkist annual premium plan. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon manager, and special thanks as always to my patrons, who are the unanswered questions that lead to the loss of faith that is my channel. If you'd like to help people find truth, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time! Hurricanes blowing my house down, house down, house down. Hurricanes blowing my house down all the live long day. Oh fuck.